two, three, and two, one SAS, so uh, are the reserve unit. People talk about SAS training, they always call it selection. And then you'll also be on the course where there are elements where you can't pass it. It's just ridiculous. Will he cope in a situation where he's all on his own? I said, I failed all the tests. I, I, I'm colorblind. And, and that's it. He went, ah, don't worry about it. And he got his stamp and he went, ka -ching. Nick, how are you, brother? Good, Chris, thank you. Really great to see you again so quickly. And the reason I say that is it's, it's, um, it's not often we get a podcast where I get so many messages saying, Chris, can you get that guy back on, <laughs> right? Not, no disrespect to my other wonderful guests, but in particular, I think it was the sheer honesty of the chat we had about your work uh, as a contractor in the Middle East, and, and you spoke very openly about the, the contacts, your, your unit experiences and the losses you suffered. Um, and not a lot of people were prepared to go to that uh, level of honesty, Nick. So I think um, thank you for that. And, and obviously our audience appreciate it. And they wanted to get you back because probably... There's probably about three questions I get asked the most. One, how come you're so handsome? That's me, Nick, not you. Okay. Uh, two, um, can we get someone from 7-7 Brigade on the podcast? Obviously not, not while they're working for 7-7 Brigade. They'll be, they'll be down in the comments. <laughs> they're the trolls in the comment section. But also, um, could you get someone from 2-3 SAS? And I guess the feeling there is that people genuinely want to know, how do you go from maybe being a civilian one day, walking into a recruiting office, and, and then potentially being on the road to special forces the next? And, um, and yeah. So over to you. Yeah, I, th I think uh, the first step that people need to make is uh, just try and find out as much information as possible. There's a lot out there nowadays, isn't there, to be fair, generally, as I think you mentioned on the last podcast. You know, this, it's an open book to a certain extent. Um, certainly with two, three, there's a lot of open source information out there. And if you go to a recruiting office, you can kind of get a really good understanding of what kind of level of fitness, uh, you know, the strength and conditioning kind of process you need to go through to, to start that process. Uh, what courses, you know, essentially you might be doing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so you can get quite a good understanding. It's just that people don't make that initial step. They think, oh, well, I, I could never do anything like that. My belief, and maybe we'll touch on it later with Elite Outdoor Fitness, is that you can pretty much achieve anything if you put your mind to it. And I, I know that sounds a little bit cheese because everybody's saying that at the moment. But I generally believe that as long as you've got a relatively um, average or, or a body composition that allows you uh, to kind of, over an extended period of time, get you to X, then there's no reason at all, as long as you're not limited by, you know, maybe some uh, like medical conditions and stuff like that, uh, why you can't get to a, a very high level of fitness. Um, and so the process is there. So, you know, I think it's uh, really initially, people need to take that step forward. And, and I'm getting people, um, certainly in the last two or three years, approaching me now that I'm becoming a little bit of the go-to for um, training specifically for courses like that. So that's a good thing. Yeah, we should point out here for friends at home who may or may not be aware, 2-3 is the, what, what do we call it, Nick? Is it the Territorial Army, the, the Reserves? Yeah, and, and, you know, if I get this wrong, I apologise because it kind of goes back and forth a little bit with its, uh, its roles and, and, and stuff like that over the years. Uh, and depending on the government, they, make, they change their mind on what kind of role they're going to be having. But generally... Uh, two, three, and two, one SAS so, uh, are, are the reserve units, and you can call them territorial army units, but they're a little bit different. I think that they're the only, certainly when I was in, they were the only reserve units, the same as, uh, you know, uh, Royal Marines Reserve and two, one, and two, three, and SBSR. Um, so they, although they're TA, if you want to call it that, it, it's not the TA it, it, in the sense that 
um, you're not going and becoming a weekend warrior with a, like a Wednesday night session. It's, it's a lot more involved in that. You know, you have to put your entire life on hold and essentially become a, like a, um, a FTRS, a, a, like a full-time reserve uh, forces soldier. Um, and, you know, the people that are looking at maybe going for, for uh, reserve uh, special forces would have to consider that, you know, the work that they do, the family that, you know, that they've got and stuff like that, because they will have to make a huge commitment at the end of their training process um, to actually facilitate kind of getting in and, and completing that whole process. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot more to it than just being a TA, TA unit. Yes, and of course, as with everything we discuss military, on this podcast, we don't rank like this service is better than this one or these guys. Everyone performs a role and everyone deserves mutual respect, no matter what 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 they do in life, let, let alone the armed forces. Mm-hmm. So um, I just want to put that one to bed before we get our uh, some teddy bear sure. out, out the pram. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in addition, we're not here to discuss R2-3 like better than two... It, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably lots of parallels, but there's probably pros and there's probably cons of, of both. One, for example, and perhaps we'll come on to that, is obviously through the reserve, you attract a lot of real quality people because they're possibly already really well educated. They might have been through the university system. They might be a, a doctor or an accountant or a I think it certainly those are the benefits, yeah, for yeah. The reserve. But, uh, and, 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 and not as well, you know, some lad that's finished school doesn't work in a factory and decides to go for it as well. If I, um, like I do now with Elite Outdoor Fitness, everybody that's on my Elite Outdoor Fitness team, not, um, not that I'm delving into that yet, but they, they, they have their own specific roles that they want to do, whether they're a physiotherapist or a nutritionist. I like to employ or work with people that are very good at what they do in those in, in those areas. I think that's what, you know, if I want to increase my fell running uh, capacity, I know how to train myself, myself for fell running, but I'll speak to Speed, who's my best mate, who's an ex-international fell runner for Wales, number one for like 12 years, to say, you know, are there any snippets? Because that's what he knows. It's what he, he, he's extremely good at, and he just gives you those little snippets. Somebody that's been in the Special Forces like myself and now runs my own company, I think that's what I bring to the table. I'm not certainly saying that I'm better than anybody else or certainly the the difference between 2-3 and 2-2. It's completely different. They're different jobs. It just happens to be that they come under the same umbrella of the special forces group. Um, And 2-3 and 2-1, although they're starting to, I I believe, merge a little bit more than they used to when I was in, um, it's about me, certainly, uh, of being an ex-SF soldier. I'm just kind of bringing that element, you know, when we go and do expeditions and stuff like that. It's about... um, I'm able to maybe uh, reflect on my experiences when I did selection or when I was working within 2-3 or even a lot later, my experiences where I've, I've been in positions or situations where I have to rely on my robustness and my resilience. And the only reason why I've been able to do that is because during training, they put you in those areas. You know, they, they, they pulled it out. That's why it's a bit of a given up course if you're looking at the SF course itself, because you need to be an individual that really wants it. And I mentioned that before. And it's not just about fitness. It's not just about carrying yourself over the hills because there's plenty of people that, that can get to that level of fitness. And I, I'm a true believer. And, you know, we've got 100% success rate bar, you know, one lad that came off with a COVID positive test more recently. Um, in that I can get pretty much anybody through the aptitude phase if they're, if they're passionate enough and they have enough drive and they have enough time on their hands and, and, and time for me to train them. Um, it's that last bit that, that is very difficult for most people to, con- to, to complete the process, which is um, having that kind of personality that will allow yourself to, to go into the hole for an extended period of time. I want to come on to that, but I'm really fascinated first to, to literally, I want to relive your journey. So oh. where, where were you? What were you doing? And how did you get to hear that there's this, entity called 23 SAS. So I was in a bit of a, a pants role in the in the military in the RAF. I kind of followed my brother because he joined up and I lived in a village, didn't have anybody. One of the lads went from power, power red and he um he was mixed race and he kind of had a bit of bullying and he kind of uh, I was at school with him and he didn't have any good kind of stories to tell um because he he uh, he didn't finish the course and so 
I didn't really have any people to steer to, to say, you know, what military unit can I go into? So I joined about. Uh, and then when I was on the, at the end of about five years of, of doing that, I was like investing heavily into my fitness at that point. I was just doing everything. And I was kind of winning a lot of races. I was into triathlons and weights and running and Bergen work. And, and I, I think I would discuss that before. I'd like cut around and find out where all the CFTs were going on down at Older Shop and all that lot and just uh, ring the PTIs up and ask if I can come and go on them. And towards the end of my five years, I went down to um, RAF St. Morgan and uh, there was uh, there was some SF lads down there um, and I'd never seen anybody that had been in that unit before. And uh, one of, believe it or not, one of the drivers, or I think it was a driver or cook or something on one of the squadrons down there, I'd been on a few exercises and I kind of knew him because we used to go on the lash a little bit together. And he was there and he said, oh, you're still doing your fizz and that. And he introduced me to one of the SB lads. And, uh, and they said, oh, I heard you, you're a bit, um, you're fit and all this. Like. I said, yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, you got a Bergen. And I bought my own olive green Bergen because you go, don't get issued green kit really when you're in the, in the RAF line. And, um, and he, there was a race up to, it was three and a half miles up to Water Tower and back, and back again, so seven miles. Uh, and they, I can't remember what the time was now, so about 53 minutes or something like that, the record was, with 40 pounds on. And they said, you're a fancy crack at that. Well, I, I went and did it, and I knocked seven minutes off their time. And to be fair, you know, the SF lads, everybody expects them to be hard as nails and fit as a fiddle. But generally, you know, they're very consistent at all of that, obviously, because it's important for their job. But I was just, I just wanted to do really well. And so I, I worked hard and, and took a bit of time off. And he, um, he, they bought me a crate of beer. And I was only young. I was only about 20... 20, I was saying 19, 20, yeah, 21, 22 years of age. And they took me helicasting, so we were jumping out of a chin at the next day, just as a well done to me. And they bought me a um, they bought me a case of beer as well. And that was it. That was it. I was absolutely hooked because at the end of that, he said, Have you ever considered going uh, and joining the special forces? You know, straight away with my uh, uh, my reaction was, Well, I'm in the RAF, you know, I I, I do weapon handling skills once a year, you know. I'm not an underwater knife fighter. And I just expected that I needed to be some sort of a very experienced soldier before I went for it. And he said, no, not, not, the, not the case at all. Um, and unfortunately for me, or fortunately, depending on which way you want to look at it, I left the RAF because I felt that that was the right route. Uh, and then I trained for a couple of years and then I joined 2-3 um, at Birmingham. There's a location in Birmingham. Um, and I was the only one to pass in the whole of the West Midlands area, actually. It was just me on my own with two DS driving up to Scotland. They had essentially, we'd ruck up on a Thursday because there'd be like two or three or four days, uh, like exercises. Or right, hang on, let's, Nick, I'm conscious I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So, so physically, like, what do you do then? Do you, do you have to find your nearest recruiting office? Do you do, do, you do it online or...? Yeah, you could, you could, it's online. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's telephone numbers. You ring them up and you just speak to somebody and they'll tell you, or they'll ask you, what, uh, are you ex-military or not ex-military? Uh, what experience have you got? What fitness requirements you probably need to have? Give you a little bit of a training program. And then they would kind of manage you, I suppose, over an extended period of time uh, on what course you'd like to do. I.e., if you're non-military, you'd have to go and do some like infantryman courses. I think it's about six to eight weeks in total but they manage it, manage it so that you can do it a week or two weeks or four weeks at a time. So it works with your life that you've got in a job. And once you complete those courses, you'll then go on like a, a pre-course, which is pretty cheeky, before that, and you've got to pass that, right, then so, so go on selection. Yeah, so tell us about this. Did you have to do the pre-course? I didn't actually, not at that time, no. I've been in the military anyway, so that kind of helped me. Um, and I didn't... The, I um, I had to go for an assessment weekend, so it was essentially like, but it wasn't the briefing courses that they've got now. It was something a bit different because it was quite a long time ago. Is the RAF classed as the military? <laughs> no, probably, probably not. Like, <laughs> fly oh, around. No, the RAF yeah, it is. You know, there's, there's some great people in all the forces, as you well know. I met some quality people in the RAF, and, and there's a lot of them that are seven at Hereford now, actually. Yes. So you didn't have to do these build-up courses. When, when was your first tester? I mean, for me, for example, um, it was in the recruiting office when I said, I, I want, I'd, I'd like to forward an application for the Royal Marines, please, right? I said that because my mate told me that's what you have to say, right? So I stuck to the script. I'd like to forward an application for the Royal Marines, please. Oh, Sergeant, I think he said, make sure you say his rank. And he said, all right, and son, 
pop up on that pull-up bar. And uh, and and that's it. You know, it's uh, training for something like that. If, if that's how we're going to say it, it training for something like this course uh, is very daunting for most people. I, I'd like to think that I take that away from them because you can actually achieve that. If, they, if you think oh, I've got to do twenty-five pull-ups in one go and you can't do one, you can do twenty. If you can do one, you can do twenty-five. It's a process that just takes a little bit of time, and it's about. Yeah making sure you get that process we, right. We, with, with selection and the pre-selection, just, just, just finishing what you asked about the assessment course, people would be expected, for example, to, to, um, to be able to uh, go on the assessment course. They need to be at a level where they're carrying 85 pounds running. Um, and then also uh, maybe do things like the bleep test and do strength and conditioning kind of assessments with press-ups and sit-ups and squat thrusts and burpees and pull-ups and, and loaded as well. And it's really just making sure that you're capable to pass the course. And that assessment course, actually, I say it really cheeky because it is, because if you can pass that, it is a good indicator that you can do quite well on the course. But you need to be prepared for that. And I would probably suggest... It's a lot different than when I joined Two Three because it was done over a number of long weekends, nine of them, and then we go and do selection, as it were, after that. Whereas now, uh, I would probably make an assumption that it's completely changed, and that you would need to, the day that you go for that briefing course, you need to be eighty-five, hundred pounds strong, and you need to be fast, and you need to be running ten miles in maybe sub one fourteen in a pair of boots, relatively flat. Uh, and there are some markers. Now, for most people, maybe listening to this would go, I can't get anywhere close to that, but you can. It's just having a, a nice, a, the right amount of guidance at this, at this time. Because what's happening, I would make an assumption and say that what's happening on selection at the moment is people are going to the briefing course and then again, just getting hammered by like having 85 pounds put in their back and then expecting to run six or seven miles with that and then drop it down to 55 and then do like sub nine minute mile pace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because uh, they're just not ready and they don't have, there's not many processes in place. And the normal kind of training programs when you go to a recruitment office that they push out to people, I, I, I've had a look at them and I don't, I don't, I would probably say that if I were, when I write my plans out for people that look and do those courses, they are completely different um, in, their, in their progression uh, and also where you need to be T minus three months before that kind of assessment course. Got you. Um, so I'll just, just thought something I wanted to ask you that ask you then um yeah so oh, I, I'm, I'm still intrigued to hear Nick at what point did you interface with this and, and in, in in how did, I mean literally talk us through it so do, do you, you've gone to recruiting office they've said yeah you're, you you're going to go for this assessment do you have to like drive to it they come and pick you up is it it no uh, you, you'll be you know um you have to obviously uh, go through it depending on whether you're just a civilian or whether you'll come out of the military or how long you've been out of the military. Would yeah. it be dependent on how many of the courses, like infantry type courses that you need to do to get your soldier skills up? Yeah. But at the very beginning of that, you would just ring the number up or you go online and you would speak to somebody that manages this process and they will ask you a number of questions and you would then probably have to go for like a medical and a basic yeah, I'm try, what I'm trying to get to, Nick, is I, I want to hear your story. Not, not the criteria like for people who want to join. Where do you go for this? Are you nervous? Are you like, oh, my God, I'm trying out for the SES today? Are you like, no, it's going to be easy? Yeah, so, so my story then, it, and, and it has changed, so just, just putting that out there. Um, it has changed a lot. I went uh, for an assessment. I, I worked up initially and had like uh, medical uh, blah blah blah. I um, I'm colour blind, so I failed the medical for colour blindness. And the the guy that was down there, the administrator, said, "You, you know, look, dude, you, you seem quite fit in that, and you've got good history. Um, you need to go and see if you can get it passed." So I went around the country for about two or three weeks um, to try and uh, get all these different tests. And I even bought, I even got one of the books to try and memorise all the things. And even I couldn't rem couldn't remember all the pages. And when I failed all the tests, basically, when I went back there. I said, I failed all the tests, I, I, I'm colourblind, and, and that's it. He went, ah, don't worry about it. And he got his stamp and he went, ka -ching, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> Result. I don't think that happens anymore. So I was like, oh, God, what a gift. So, um, yeah, I started and I was on the assessment weekend about two or three weeks after that. Uh, and I went down there and it was an, it was an eight mile run. Down, down, down where, Nick? In, 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 a Bur- in the Birmingham area, West Midlands area. All right. What, to an army camp or? Yeah. It was, it was, it was like a, quite a, um, a discreet um, army location. And what do you, do you pass? There's a the number of those all around the country, but for the whole of the West Midlands, it's near, in the Birmingham area. But depending on where you live, um, it's just a bit of a it's a bit of a cake and ass party if you live down in Devon and Cornwall because you have to travel all the way up. But bar that, there's there's always a location that's relatively close to you within about an hour's drive, an hour and a half's drive, I would imagine. So I worked down at uh, Birmingham. There must have been about 40 odd people on there. And by the end of that day, there was about uh, 15, 16 left. Uh, and what, why? Just because it was um, assessments, uh, swimming. Uh, a ber- something with a Bergen run or something like that and then also a, a boot run it was over a weekend it was a bit of nighttime stuff um, it was a bit of lessons it was a little bit of uh, political kind of stuff as well just to see if you were engaging in the news and listening to the news and you knew what was going on around the world a little bit um, etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and they they went through a number of assessments uh, strength kind of assessments as well and at the end of it they told you whether you passed or failed it I was lucky enough to have passed can we take it one at a time? And so the Bergen run, you're saying you're carrying about 80, 85 pounds. Um, yeah, I think it was 85, 85 pounds and they dropped it down to 55, I think 54, something like that. And then it was like a 18 minute, sub 18 minute, two miles. So that is basically, I mean, when you're out and about backpacking or whatever, you, you, your Bergen's going to be about 20 kilos, right? About, about the same as if you're going on holiday for three weeks. That's double, that's double that weight. So that's like when you rock up at the airport to go on holiday, it's like double the amount of luggage and you're carrying it on your back. Yeah, it's a heavy weight. Eight, five pounds is heavy, but it's achievable. It's very achievable. You know, if you go to, um, you know, depending on what, you, what you're doing SF-wise, now you go to the jungle, you're carrying 135, 145 pounds as last man water carrier carrying everybody's four litre water bags and there might be six to eight blokes in a, in a team and then you've got all your ops kit on top of that as well. So, you know, it, it is part of you doing that for like, you know, quite a long time. So it is possible. You know, I did, I did those world, re- world records that have not been signed up by Guinness yet, but I did those to prove that, you know, if you can run that with 80 pounds or do a, a marathon with 80 pounds and an half marathon with 100 pounds. You, and I, I built up from scratch because I was working in the Middle East and I didn't do lots of running. And I did that to to show people, to say, look, you, it's a process. You can get stronger and stronger, and it doesn't have to be insanely hard to train like that. And so don't be put off by those weights is the point, because a lot of people are. They think, I can never do that. They put 35 pounds on the back, and that feels heavy, doesn't it, if you're not used to it? Yeah, we're going to come on to your record. So uh, uh, what's the effects then of carrying this weight? Are your shoulders chafing? At what, what kind of boots are you allowed to wear, and, and are you getting blisters? Yes, yeah, like anything, if you progress your training correctly, your body will get used to everything. People that just lob boots on and go out for a boot run and put 50 kilograms on their back are going to come unstuck and there will be an absolute clip, won't they? But if you're going to go out and run a marathon and you start wearing different pairs of trainers, you do four miles and eight miles and you work it all the way up over weeks and weeks, your feet don't really uh, have a drama with it because you're progressing through, aren't you? And it's the same with Bergen work. Your back, you know, every time I go and see the physio, he says, oh, something wrong with your back here yeah, and this, that and the other. And, it, and he goes, after a while, he goes, oh, you got unusual back, you know, your muscular kind of areas in your back are a little bit different than most people's because I've spent most of my life with a Bergen on my back. And so your back starts to kind of form to, to, to uh, ensure that you become more efficient in, in, in carrying that type of weight. Um, and your shoulders become a little bit stronger. You start getting used to the kind of the shoulder straps. Um, and, and then you'll start, you know, your feet and, you know, uh, things, you know, the, the bottoms of your feet will become a bit more stronger. But it's, just lobbing a Bergen on and going out and doing a run, you know, that's putting a lot of force and stress on your body. Um, you know, that's why a lot of people uh, that come to me and they just go, oh, I've just been running around the Bergen on for weeks and weeks. They might have plantar fasciitis or Morton syndrome or um, cast and slayers issues and stuff like that. And so we bound back to basics, same as we do when we're training anybody to become a good runner, good cross-country runner, good fell runner, and then add the weight. <clears throat> right. I'm looking forward to talking about this after because um, 
someone tried to overtake me on on my city's biggest hill this morning. <laughs> I I couldn't be having that. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah, that good bit of competitiveness is healthy. Very childish, but that's my hill, mate. And uh, there'll be one person running up 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 it quickly today. <laughs> it's really funny, but yeah, I I I, I like the old running. My, my, just a quick dip, sorry. One of my good mates that I was in with, he's got a, like a caravan somewhere on the Welsh coast and he was a, he's a very good, talented cyclist, or used to be. Uh, and at that period of time, he was coming up one of the large hills that's kind of like the Snowdonia area. So it's a pretty challenging climb. He looked behind him and about half a click behind him, there was some, some bloke that seems to be kind of gaining on him. So he thought, well, I'm not having that. So same sketch, he put his foot down a bit. Look behind him again. The bloke was about 20 metres away. He was on a mountain bike. And uh, when he came up alongside him, it was one of the blokes from our old unit. That, and just had, he was on a flipping mountain bike without hardly sweating at all. Yeah, a good dip. But a bit of healthy competition is, uh, is good. You know, and that's why, you know, COVID and stuff has been so difficult for people because going out and training on your own, you know, this is why, and we'll maybe delve into it a little bit later, Elite Outdoor Fitness is working well because... You can train with other people, whether it's virtually or not. It's online and groups of people because it's difficult, isn't it, when you go? And if you go to a running club, it's set, your, your 400s that you do on a track are going to be so much faster if you're with other people doing them. You train harder and you mm. and it's more enjoyable as well. Tell some. us about, about the swimming, Nick, because that's always that used to be my nemesis. It's something I didn't really get good at until I was about 40, and then I swam 10 miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a marine, it's not good, that is it. <laughs> you've all you've got to pass this basic swimming test in the marine. Yeah. So, on our ours would probably be similar, to be yeah. fair, mate. Yeah, on our, um, on our three hard. day potential recruits course, they just say, right, get up on the diving board, and it's about a I don't know, say a five meter high diving board. I did the PRC actually, yeah. mm. and, and many, said, many, right, many years ago. Um, say, they it's the same. Fun. It's the same sketch, mate. It's uh, it's quite easy. All I would say is, and this is the question I ask anybody that comes to me, is I say, "How's your swimming? Have you always been a swimmer? Can you remember being taught swimming?" I can't remember being taught swimming. Either. I was about four, four or five years of age, and um, people that have kind of always been swimming since they were young have a tendency to be very confident in the water generally. But people like yourself uh, that maybe learn swimming a lot later on, they always lack that confidence. They never seem as confident as maybe somebody that. As, as always swam and so <clears throat> for those people then maybe you need to invest in a bit of swimming and it's really building your confidence up in water with weight maybe you know jump it when you if you're in water for it not i'm not saying you just go jump into water i'm saying if you're on uh, one of the selection weekends for uh, the, the the swim kind of test will be like wearing a pair of boots and fully clothed and even having a burgundy water and it's just getting used to that you know you're not going to sink and the bur burgundy is a flotation device let's be honest it's just that when you've got all that kit, you can feel quite overwhelmed. And maybe jumping off of the high, the board with all of that kit on as well can sometimes feel a bit daunting. And it's really just getting yourself to um, used to being a relatively average swimmer. You don't need to be a really strong swimmer. You're not going to be going them down and doing the pool stuff and stuff like that. You can go do that, but then you know there are, there are other kind of courses to allow you to bring your swimming on, etc. But um, certainly, if you're not a swimmer. It still doesn't have to hold you back. When I was in 2-3, that there was a guy there that said to me at the beginning of the swim, because we went and did a load of stuff down at Paul when I was in, and we were down there for quite a, a couple of months, I think. And one of the guys on day one said, uh, said uh, Nick, just, uh, just keep an eye on me, will you, mate? I'm, I'm really nervous about this. And I said, what do you mean? And, and he said, oh, I'm a shit swimmer. I can hardly swim. And I said, but and his, his day job that he used to do every so often, because in that fact, we were like, uh, on FTRS on full-time reserve service at that point but normally he was a diver and uh, I said but you're a diver that's your day job and he went you don't need to swim to be a diver mate <laughs> so, always made me laugh that did but yeah you don't need to be a strong swimmer but it's certainly if you um, if you haven't always swam you could invest a little bit of training mm -hmm. just to build your confidence up so how does the how is the the actual you can expand on this. So wh when you hear people talk about SAS training, they always call it selection. And it sounds to us that uninitiated that the selection is actually like the train. I mean, you, you've got to prove yourself through it, but it, 
it seems like the stuff you do on it is also also like part of the training. Sorry, I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm probably not making sense. Um, no, I mean, I mean, proving that resistance to interrogation, for example, that's that's something you've got to prove you can do be resistant to interrogate but it's mm. also it's also training you you know at, yes it, gotcha it's training you at the same time so what how how is how is all that structured in two three so yeah very similar uh, it's, it's it's very similar in that respect and, and certain elements of that you can't train yourself uh, what if you look at selection you know people can go to war or they can do x y and z they have a tendency, don't they, to refer back to selection, and it's because it's um, it's very it's a, a very unique course. I, I you know I, I won't lie, I, I loved it. I loved the challenge of it, and if I could go and do it again, I would, mm -hmm. uh, because it challenges you at all different levels, uh, and that's why it's so impressive, and that's why maybe you capture something that's a little bit unique in an ex special forces soldier, quite possibly. It's because physically. On the attitude phase, over the hills, etc., you've got to you've got to not just be fit and strong. Of course, you've got to do that, but you've got to be really resilient and robust, uh, and have a, a like a, a a level of self confidence that allows you, all on your own, time and time again, to feel like you're failing, but drive on and drive on. Mm -hmm. And then you'll also be on the course where there are elements where you can't pass it. It's just ridiculous where they'll put you through things where you are just absolutely exhausted. So then you go, you have to dig deep then and just keep going and keep going where a lot of people, they just go, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm giving up because you can do that at any stage. And when you go on to maybe the latter parts of the course that you just mentioned, um, it's quite possible that those kind of courses are designed to, um, to test you emotionally. It, it, it's, also physically to a certain extent, but your emotional and the imbalances that you might have at a hormonal level uh, are huge because you're so exhausted for an extended period of time and you're lacking in food and water, you're at a very, very low ebb when quite possibly you're being tested uh, for all these different levels. And some people don't cope with that. You know, and those, those um, tests, if you want to call them that, are there for a reason because when you're in a war zone, and let's say you're in, a, uh, in combat, um, and you're under a huge amount of emotional stress, you, you, need to, um, you need to be the type of person that can manage that. If you've got to show any aggression, you've got to make sure that that's con controlled to a certain extent. And so all those kind of tests that you look at that are on selection are, are, dev are designed to um, help them make that assessment of you to say, will he cope in a, a situation where he's all on his own and he's very stressed out and he needs to make decisions? Can he be so fatigued and maybe wounded where he can actually not be thinking about himself but be thinking about his team? Can he be this? Can he be that? And those tests are actually really good at that. And so when you, that's why you have a huge sense of accomplishment when you finish the course like that. And people, for years and years, they might go and serve tw 25 years in, in the SAS or something. But they, they always kind of stay around to talk about selection. No, it's because... It tests you at so many different levels. I would probably say all of the levels um, and all on one course and all at the same time as well. Uh, and, and the people that get through that, they learn a lot about themselves. Yes. And how, yeah, I mean, yeah, of, 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 of course. I mean, the, I think one of the biggest lessons I ever learned was coming off the endurance course and and I hadn't managed to pass it yet. We'd done, I think it was my fourth attempt or third attempt. And just in one moment, I don't know why, I just dug deep and I pulled out of the bag. I just pushed through that pain barrier. And then it became almost like quite pleasurable, you know, to pain, still painful, but knowing that you can keep going was that a good learning curve there. But can you tell us, Nick, um, how... How long is the selection then? For, 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 I mean, you said it's very similar, but obviously the full-time guys are working full-time, aren't they? So are you doing this over weekends or, or do you have to go well, away? When I did it or now? Uh, either or both. Yeah, so when I did it, it was over a series of about five weekends and there were long weekends as well, like three, four days. Uh, and, and, you know, it was um, demanding. 
you know, it was rocking up on a Friday night. You know, I was on my own at one point, but we would drive up to Scotland. I'd get there at like half past five in the morning and I'd be running at six and I would have driven all the way up while the DS were getting their heads down in the back of the hand driver. And they'd want to be woken up by me lighting a fag and putting it in their mouth about 10 minutes before we got to the location. And, um, and they'd always say, yeah, we did it when we were on selection, mate. Yeah, what was that? But, um, you know, or, or going to the Brecon Beacons, we'd, we'd get there at like... Um, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning on a, on a, a, a early doors on Saturday morning, and they would rock, they put us on a like a re-entrant where the water was coming down with a fence, and they, we, weren't, we weren't allowed that side of the fence. We had to tie our bivvies to the thing. And on one occasion, I woke up, I must have had about like two hundred kilograms of water in the bottom of my bivvy. Um, they just make sure that it's hugely uncomfortable. You don't get any sleep, and then the next day you're on the hills all day. You're on the hills all night with maybe one, two, three hours sleep maximum between those and then speed marches as well. Mm. And then, and then you'd come home and you'd come home on like a Sunday night, a Sunday midday, Monday, do you train? Because you're trying to recover from weekend, Tuesday, you might get a light train session in Wednesday, you get an absolutely rag round. Now it's a little bit difficult, different now than that. And that would be over a 10 week phase and it would be just building and building and building. And within that 10 week end phase, you'd have a number of sp- uh, specific tests. Certainly, you know, there's a, a civilian event out there called the Fan Dance, for example. You know, that's one of them. Uh, and there are a couple of others as well. When you are, um, you need to pass a, a certain talk, weight. Talk, a certain talk, us, talk us through the Fan Dance thing, because this is something that we hear a lot about. I, I just picture that it, Penny Farn is a mountain in Wales or... Um, so I actually work uh, with one of the companies on it, actually, as a consultant. So Avalanche Endurance Events, uh, Ken Jones. Um, it's, uh, and the reason why I work with him is because it's, he runs a good, authentic race, actually. It's, uh, it, it's good. It's uh, 14 miles up over the fan, down to the halfway point and back again. And, and to be fair, you know, we use it as quite a good uh, marker. And that's, you know, that's why it's there, because um, to carry 35 pounds plus food and water over that in a, in a good time, um, forces you if you want a good time in that to, to hit all the components of physical fitness and that's why it's a, it's a good challenge you know um, and, and once again you know m- most people they go and do it for the first time and get it done in about six hours and within about a year or two of training specifically for it, they're, they're doing it in like three and a half four hours um, and there, there are lots of civilian events I think now that are doing very similar types of uh, uh, courses I, I work DS on that one um, they do SF weights one uh, they do clean fatigue, i.e. just going in a pair of boots and some survival kit, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's loads of kind of events that replicate the types of things that may be on selection. And so would, it, would somebody on selection run the whole thing or are you run walking as, or do you, do you trot? People walk it, but there are cutoffs. So I think you have to get to the halfway point, at a certain cutoff. Um, obviously, I'm one of the people that enforces that. And that really is there just to make sure that people aren't cutting around the hills and getting really tired because that's obviously when we have dramas and stuff. So we have cut-offs specifically for that reason. Um, but most people, especially if they come to Elite Outdoor Fitness, I, I, um, I train them up. We, we have an RTG, and I'm sure we'll discuss it later, but the remote training group, specifically event for Paris 10, fan dance, commando shuffle, stuff like that. Uh, and we, you know, I won a fan dance last year. Yeah, and Powers Town and Commander Shuffle. But, uh, uh, but a lot of my people, they win it or they get good top 10 places because they have a better understanding of just how specifically to train for that. So where they, they, year one, they might have shuffled round and got round in five and a half hours. Um, I say, look, you, you know, how was it? And they say, awful. It was so hard. And I say, well, maybe make it easier, you know, maybe do a little bit of LSD running and, and, and a little bit of strength work and a little bit of hill reps all at a manageable level so that over time you can uh, be more efficient when you're going over that course over 14 miles. Yeah. And, uh, and let's come on and talk about these events because you, you're he- hearing more and more about them. I'm more, I'm more sort of interested in for these troopers on se- or potential troopers on selection. Um, what do they do? I mean, the fan dance sounds like it's pretty straightforward up over and back but you hear about people having grid references and co- coordinates that they've got to. Not, not on the fan dance. No, it's all, uh, it's all marked out. Pretty simple. That's all marked. But what, yeah. so why, when we say read Ant Middleton's memoir, is he talking about map reading and 
he's missed this checkpoint and he's running to catch up. What- yeah, so so when, when you're on um, when you're on selection, there'll be phases where you need to navigate on your own, and they're tests, and you will need to go from one RV to another to another to another, and you never know when the end is, and they will have specific routes that that um, that they will have for that selection process. Um, and you need to carry certain weights. And as you go, go through selection, the weights will increase. So it could be, for, for example, um, some of the civilian events, and I'm probably assuming that, that it's very similar to the tests that you have on selection, would be um, SF weight, which is 45 pounds plus food and water, and you're expected to carry five litres of water at 2.2 pounds each, uh, a smock that isn't part of the weight, uh, and they, uh, and let's say you carry something in your hand that is 11 pounds, which is the same weight as a weapon you carry on selection. Mm-hmm. And so that weight is about 68, 71 pounds. Yeah. If you look at that. Um, and you're expected to come in and under, I think it's four hours on, on the fan dance. So going to do one of the civilian events is, is a, it's a good way of like kind of looking at where your fitness is, isn't it really? And um, cause you can go cut around and do it with 35 pounds on. If you're doing all right at that in a relatively good time, then you can see how much more training you've got to put in to, to maybe do the SF weight because these civilian events do have the SF, SF weight events and they're about 45 pounds plus food and water, et cetera, et cetera, as I've just said. Got so what they're, they're, they're pretty hard tests. Um, uh, and something that, uh, you know, you need to have a good structured tr- training program over an extended period of time, not just to do the civilian event, but to, to, um, to do on, on selection. OK, so we know from regular SAS selection that the, it's the hills phase. Then what is it? The survival phase and, and the resistance to interrogation that. Does that yeah, come- so there's a little bit of a process in the middle uh, where you engage in. I would call it like the, the rustic stuff. It's hard. It's um, on your belt buckle. It's on your elbows, you know. Um, it's on your, on your belt buckle as in lying down with all of your kit on, heavy stuff. It's a bit different. And it's also maybe learning some of the tactics that you would need to, to get in uh, and teaching uh, the majority of the tactics. And then when you progress into the latter stages, you put it all together in a fully tactical kind of um, – uh, yeah, in a fully tactical way, so that then you, then you can be tested at all levels then. So it's a process of actually teaching you, but at the same time testing you, as you, as you discussed before. Yeah. Um, so, again, with regular selection, it, it seems like you're running, a, you're doing the escape evasion on the hills for, I don't know, it seems like a week or something, and then you get, you know, you, you, your captors cap, capture you and then take you for interrogation. And that seems to be, I don't know, I'm guessing 48 hours of sort of extreme hardship. Yeah, so, so like with everything, everything's, everything's manageable for, for people. You know, if, you, if you're watching this and you're thinking, OK, I, I, I'd really struggle with that, you'd, you'd probably surprise yourself. It's, yeah. um, and of course, it tests you at a very kind of raw level, you know, um, What's it, what's, it like, what's it like, Nick? What I'm trying to get to is what's it like in two, three? If you're doing this over weekends... It's the same. Essentially the same when I was in. I had to do the, the same bit. There was a small element at the end which was slightly different that I, I, I can't mention on here, really. But um, generally, it was the same. And it's really just taking you throughout the whole course to a, a level where you're at your lowest ebb. Mm. Uh, ex- a, a, an extended period of time um, and it's a bit of a longer process, as you just mentioned, where you've got no food, minimal water, and you're absolutely exhausted. Like right down to a muscular cellular level. I remember when I was on my course, um, we got essentially ID'd by um, like the hunter group that were looking for us. And as we all turned, I was the only SF bloke in that team that I was in, I think. And as we all turned and ran up this wood line, um, they just disappeared ahead of me because I was so tired because I, my build up to that had been exhaustive rather than theirs, maybe pilots or navigators and stuff like that that had to do, the, do that part of the course, come on to it at different levels. They don't do the whole of selection, do they? They just come on for that. Um, 
And I was, I was absolutely exhausted. And I remember thinking then, God, at muscular level, I'm so tired. Uh, but you don't realise it, you see. You know, if you videoed yourself afterwards and looked at you, how fast you're running and how fast you're moving on the ground, it'd be so much slower. Um, and then you've got the added bits like, you know, on mine, I went in uh, to, to, to obey the dogs. I had to go into a, a reservoir and I, I went under the water to, to, just so that my head was out. Uh, and it was, I think, in about November time, and it was like Baltic. And I, I think I got, um, I was hypothermic for sure. Um, and, and then there's a process that you kind of go through when you then possibly get captured and go into the further elements of that course. Um, you're just at a low ebb. Uh, you're at the lowest you are, and they, they kind of uh, they they add to that with a number of techniques that they use to to make sure that they can test you uh, at all the different emotional levels, which uh, which is is um it's good for them. It's a it's a learning experience for them because they could kind of get a good picture, and you've probably seen that on TV on the SES. Uh, you know, are you tough enough, etc. For when they're showing you a very small part of it at the end. I think they've only been on that course like two a week or two weeks, a little bit, and they still look like they get some stuff down the next and stuff. Whereas when you're doing uh, you know courses on selection, they, sometimes you haven't eaten for like six seven days, uh, and and the two or three weeks before that you've eaten sort of as well. So. It plays on people's minds, things like that. I haven't eaten. My, I think, you know, I snapped my kneecap on, on one of my courses. Um, and, I, you know, you just have to crack on. And so all these small things start eating away at you. And, you, and you're constantly thinking, I don't think I can do this. And my body's in rag order and this hurts. And I think I've got pneumonia and I'm, stood, you know, maybe possibly kneeling in a, in a field, bollock naked, <laughs> you know, for example. There's a lot of parts of it that... that um, that provide them with a, a wealth of knowledge about you as an individual. Nick, can you tell us, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to know, so when you get compromised by this hunter, this hunter force, and they slap a bag over your head or what, you know, or a, or a sack or what, whatever it is, Hessian sack, uh, can you just talk us through like what happen, happens then I'm guessing you, you get on transport and they take you to the interrogation house. And how long, how does that work? What, what, just, just want to hear your experience of it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of um, go over parts of my experience for, for me. I, uh, I, I laid up in the water for a little bit. I was on my own. And we had, I can, the, 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 uh, you know, the DS are trying to get to certain locations to give you a bit of food. And if they can't make it there because the hunt falls on them as well, they don't get open. So I hadn't eaten for like about four or five days, like nothing. And I'd like a uh, thrush of the mouth and uh, add uh, a bit of blood poison, I think, from having uh, like, what do they call them again? Those things that you find where there's lots of cattle. I can't remember now. Um, and, and I was just in, in a bit of a rag order. And I was coming along a wood line about four in the morning because I, I'd laid up and I was so cold. I was uncontrollably shaking. And I thought, I'm going down massive style. And I was feeling really ill. And I was coming for a good line. And I was a little bit delirious, to be fair, because I remember look, I remember just slightly looking right. And it's quite funny, really, when you look back, because flying through the air was a Gurkha, like in a Superman flight. And he, he hit me shoulder height. And the next thing I know, we were down by this uh, Land Rover at the bottom of the road somewhere. And I had a bag on my head. And somebody was trying to ram something up, up under my chin. And I thought, oh, here we, here we go. It's starting now. And uh, it was a uh, like a foot long flipping Snickers bar or something. And luckily for me, I'd been caught by like some Gurkha lads, and uh, they they rammed this flipping uh, like flipping seven inch like uh, Snickers bar down my throat, which was an absolute gift for me. And then that's the process starts. And then you obviously not that it can be discussed too too deeply at all, but you go through a process then where they test you uh, at a um, at a mental level, and there's a number of different techniques that they can use to to um, to uh, emphasise the the stress that you you find yourself um, physically and mentally over an extended period of time. And during that time, they um, they they take you through a process where they're trying to get information from you, and and they're trying to establish your reaction to to, to that whole scenario, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, a, a mate of mine was telling me that when he did it, uh, he said they had babies, baby endlessly, ba a baby crying and 
that they put you in a stress position against the wall. And if you even deviated from it to try and, you know, if you're tempted to fall asleep or whatever, you get roughly. Uh, yeah, rough it's, not like, uh, it's not like you'd see on the. Well, it is and it isn't. You know, the SES, you'd suffer enough thing. They show you a little bit of a glimpse of maybe some of the stuff you might go through. Um, but it's uh, it's very, very challenging. And you've got some uh, exceptionally strong uh, individuals, mentally and physically, that, that fall apart on, on that part of the course because they, they can't handle those elements very well. But it's a good indicator. It's a good uh, test for yourself. And when you come out of there, it's a it you you have a better and clearer understanding mm. about you know what's in here and what's what's what, in your head. How, how many days are you in that captivity bit then? Um, I, I would probably imagine it's so it, it's not more than like two or three days really that you're in that l- last part. I, w- I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at these SAS programs, they're in there for about two or three days aren't they and they've just got to hang in there um i'm guessing that there's um again let's talk about the sas tv programs they seem to go without food for that period yeah it's a it's a build-up process isn't it you don't you don't need food really it's just it's just an, something that's added in there. You can train for all of this, by the way, Chris. You can. Even that last part, that I know I've kind of uh, gone over it a little bit, um, <clears throat> but uh, you can train for all of that. Uh, and that's what I do, you know, in, in part of my job, you know, is, is training people for that. And you think, how can you train yourself and put yourself through that uh, emotional stress? Um, you, you essentially go through a very small part of that when you're in the last 10 or 15 seconds of a 400 effort. Uh, it's about teaching yourself to be very comfortable at being uncomfortable. And you have to teach and gradually add that to it progressively. I hate that word, but it, it makes sense over an extended period of time. And once you start doing that, if you do the correct build up training for something like that, when you get to, to that uh, part of, of, of a course such as that, um, you're more prepared. You know, you can, you can come unstuck and still have the balance so that you're not coming unstuck emotionally. You can, body can be an absolute rag order. You can uh, be so thirsty because you haven't drunk for days. You can have worms, um, mites. Uh, you, you, you've been bullet naked in a field for a few days. You're cold, you're tired. Uh, you think you're failing everything, but you can still have presence of mind to say, I'm all right. I'm going to be all right. I can push forward because, because if you've done training hard enough and you taking yourself out on the hills for many hours and stuff like that you can be in a real kind of low place but still have the confidence to think i'll be all right and i'm going to push through and keep going so you can train for this you know it's not it sounds quite harsh when you say it like that but uh, um i would imagine you know and that th- th- it's very similar today than, than when i went through that process um and yet i found it quite hard because i i had nothing to um I had nobody to kind of help me gauge on how to prepare for, for that type of course, if that makes sense. Mm. And how, how, um, how did you get out? Of, how, how, do they, how does it come about that they tell you that it's over and whether you've passed that part of the course or not? Uh, you, you get a full brief individually. Mm. So, how, I mean, how do they get you out of that it's, building? It, 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 do they... Do they oh. say, come with me, Sonny, or do they say, take your hood off? Or The, the same as that you, that's on the programme. Yeah, yeah. When there's, issue, when there's an issue, there'll be one in, one individual there that, that you recognise that says it's over. Right. It would be a um, something very specific so you understood. And even, even then, you know, <laughs> one of my mates, for example, uh, I think he's probably the only one to date. He, uh, when he started the process he, they said yeah get get naked so he got naked uh, and they said put that like uh boiler suit on or whatever it was uh and he said you know like he wasn't prepared to answer that question or whatever and they said no put the thing on so he uh, he didn't put it on because he didn't think that to i think he's the only person that's gone through the whole of the course 
completely naked for the <laughs> for the old time. So you've got to play the game a little bit. You've got to have a clear understanding. You've got to make it work for yourself as well as they they get what they want to a certain extent. So it's it's a bit of a not a game as such, but you know you understand that it's a you, you can't just be an absolute sap and go and 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 it shows you that on the on the on the program. And so as part of that, you also need one person that can pull you out of it and say, look. You know, when I did mine, I got a steer. Um, somebody pulled, that person pulled me out and said, stop doing X, Y, and Z. And I just, I didn't say anything. And then I was reinserted. And they allow you to do that because it's a learning process on both sides. Not as much on your side, you know, you have to go through the process. But at the same time, they're trying to say, look, you're not going to be doing loads of courses like this every month. This is probably the only one or maybe one out of two that you do during your career. And so you've got to learn from it. And this is what we're expecting from you. You're doing that and you're doing that and you shouldn't be. You know, for yeah. example, if, if, you're, if you're nodding, for example, you know, I have a tendency to move my hands and be a little bit, as you've probably noticed on this podcast, um, you can't do anything like that. You have to be very structured in the way that you come across and, 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 and because else it can be used kind of against it. Yeah. So do you do, you do a, a jungle phase then, like, the regular SCS do for two three yeah um, I've been to the jungle did it because I as part of HCR I kind of I did all that um, but uh, for two three no it's it's slightly different and do you do the para course did I do, does does two three do the para course yes yeah as far as I'm aware yeah that's part of it I think the whole process is a little bit different now. Uh, certainly even with COVID. So it's just been quite changeable, I suppose, for the last few years. And also, I, you know, I, I, I left in 2004. But generally speaking, because um, I also know people that are in recruitment, et cetera, um, it's, it's quite condensed and, and, and it's a lot different than when I went through. Uh, and people just need to be aware of that, that you really do need to, to change your life a little bit so that when you start this process, you can continue through because if you are successful – then the expectations are that you have to do X, Y, and Z and commit to. Yeah. yeah. And again, we're going to come on to that because you said something interesting earlier that I want to um, pick up on. But at what point then do you get handed your, is it, the, do you call it the Sandy Berry? Yeah, Sandy Berry and the blue, uh, like your, your belt. I, I, I got mine right at the very end. And uh, we, I was, it was in the middle of the night. It's about two in the morning. And, um, we were on an airfield somewhere. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was about two in the morning. We had a couple of the Hercs and they were dropping some stuff down for us. And uh, the commanding officer came over, pulled like, I think there was only about, there was only a handful of us, that, a handful of us that actually passed. It was eight or 10 people um, for the whole of 2 1, 2 3 and SBSR at that point. And they said, uh, Congratulations, and just shook sh- sh- around. And, uh, you know, I can honestly say it's the, uh, well, you know, apart from Littler and get married, that's the proudest kind of moment of my life. Very unique experience in that it's all about you, or what you achieved all on your own, because it is, a, it is a course. Yeah, of course, on the course, you have to become part of a team. But generally speaking, you have to go through all of that on your own. You're running over the hills with a map and compass. You're, it's physically demanding, exhausted uh, when you're over the hills and doing the aptitude kind of part. Um, much later on, you're on your belt buckle and you've got all that kit and you've got loads of ammo um, and you're having to kind of uh, drop targets uh, with different weapon systems, etc. cetera. Um, that then, it's all about you and how good you are and how quick you learn the, the, the stuff from this part of the day and then put it all together for the end part of the day and then put add extra kind of learning skills and techniques for the next day and the next day and the next day. And then much later on, at an emotional level, You've got to hold it together for yourself as well. And so for the course, that's how I felt, was it's individually, it's a, it's a proud moment for you to say, I've just done that. You know, I didn't tell anybody in, in, in my family. Uh, I just told two friends, actually, but the, the kind of in the army anyway. Um, I didn't tell anybody for about two, two or three years. Um, and I think my, my parents didn't even know until about you know, three years ago, to be fair, that I'd ever been in. I didn't need to tell anybody. I didn't feel like it. It was just it's a very individual thing mm. um, to pass. Did, you, did you ever consider uh, can you transfer across to the 
to two two, or do you have to do their selection again? You have to do their selection, yeah. Mm. Did you ever consider that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I did consider that. But yeah, it's uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Really, there was um, there's a lot of people that were, as I discussed before, that were going from two one and two three that were just getting stand up fails. Um, after I left, it changed quite a lot, and a lot of, most of them were getting in after that because they they had a bit of a I think a, a change around with DS or you know that something changed anyway because they were wondering why so many people from two one and two three that were trained by quality two two blokes would, would not get and being told you need to get go for that course. Uh, it, maybe it's changed now. So yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I get it. I get it. Nick, thanks ever so much again. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think this will be the last of our, our chats by any means. And folks, if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.